Have you ever wondered how we got to the Bible we have today? Might be surprising. That's what we'll talk about today. I could simply share with you the treasure I uncovered, but I'd rather give you the treasure map. Jane Johnson. Today we're going to talk about how the book became canon. And there's a lot of misconceptions in history, in things I read. You know, I tend to be a little bit of a history buff that ended up not exactly being true. There's a lot of disparaging things, too. You know, people want the Bible to make it look like some king back in 300 AD decided what books were going to be in the Bible and gave us some sort of a pagan mess. That is not how it went. That is not the truth of how we got the Bible. I think it's done to disparage the Bible. It's done so that we believe less in the Bible or ignore its messages because who knows what the Bible was really meant to be. We're going to talk about this from Why Should I Trust the Bible? Answers to Real Questions and Doubts People Have About the Bible by William D. Mounts. This book is pretty big, and we're only going to talk about one particular aspect of it. In other podcasts, we'll talk about other aspects of this book. But understanding where we got the Bible is an important step to us believing the Bible, studying the Bible, understanding where it came from, and answering criticisms about it. When we have the Bible, we want to first talk about, he says, what it means. So canon refers to basically a rule, something that's determined to be true, he says. But in the terms of when it's the Bible, canon are the books of the Bible that Christians accept as authoritative. So it's not just that it's helpful, it's not just that it's informative, but that it has authority. And we'll go through some of the reasons why each book was included. He says canonization is the process in which we got the Bible that we have today. And there's differences between what Protestants accept as books and Roman Catholics accept as books. I know when I was Jewish and learning about it, there was a big question about whether Esther was going to be included in the Bible. And that was because Esther doesn't mention God once in the book. But God is in that book. It's just not in the words. Esther was faithful to God and faithful to her people. And that's why it's in the Old Testament. There are other books that are called the New Testament Apocrypha, and they're not accepted as a church as a whole, such as the Gospel of Thomas, which we'll talk about later, but they may have insights or they may have interesting information. It's always been said that Constantine, when he created the Council of Nicaea, did it so that he could determine what the books were going to be accepted in the Bible. What they did do is they created the Nicene Creed because they were trying to fight against certain heresies that were out there in the world. And the heresy that pushed everyone over the edge was the Gnostic heresy. And there's another part of the book that talks a little bit about all of these, when we can talk about the Nicene Creed as well. But the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD was not a group that was meant to determine what books were going to be made into the Bible. It happened when there was a guy named Arius who taught that Jesus was not fully God. You know, there's always that thing, well, Jesus wasn't really God, or Jesus was not really human because we don't believe that things of physical matter can be God. And so then people tend to go either way around it. So the creed was there to create it. And so the traditional belief and the belief since the beginning of the church was that Jesus was both fully God and fully human. And those positions of Arius were not correct in either sense. And so Constantine didn't decide what was in the Bible. His mother did not decide what was in the Bible. In fact, it was a much longer history than that. What Constantine wanted was to get a firm grip on what was actually the creed of the church, what was important to the church, and he was looking for unity inside of a creed to help break down some of these fights that were going on at that time. He said that in no way and in no part was the canon of the Bible decided by a secret group of people living in some sort of dark cavern deciding what it was going to be deciding where these books were going to be placed in the Bible. It wasn't made at the Council of Trent in 1545, which did ratify the Old Testament, but the process, he says, of the, how the entire Bible was created is completely different. 
There's no Dan Brown secret Tom Hanks movie out there trying to make the Bible into something. It's very simple how we got the Bible. What we have are the 12 apostles who traveled with Jesus, and there were people around that went as long as Paul was alive, and they knew what was true and not true because they were all witnesses. It says that even Diocletian in 303 AD made it illegal to even own copies of the Bible. He says that at the time there were writings that were not part of canon. Some of them were fake writings or written much later or were used to justify heresies that were more modern than what was happening way back at the time of Jesus. We could see some of the heresies coming out in the time of Paul. He even mentions that some people follow Apollos and some people follow this person and that person. We should be following Jesus and not all these other teachers. He says that Gnosticism was primarily in the second century, but it reached all the way back to the first century. And books that were related to Gnosticism did not become part of the canon. So in order to determine what made it into the Bible was, first of all, was the authorship. That means who wrote the book? Is it someone who was with Jesus? Was it an apostle? Was it someone who was literally there and could witness or report on the things that were happening? And even in the Bible itself, Peter viewed Paul's writings as scripture. So it's not that they were surprised that these were going to end up as some sort of a canon. They knew what they were writing at the time was going to be canon, and they never doubted that. So it's not so much that these were a bunch of hapless fishermen who suddenly became part of the world's most famous book. They knew what they were writing. What they were putting down was scripture. He says there's a third Corinthians, which turned out to be utterly fake and not written at the time. Did the apostles write their books or dictate their books? There was some thought about some of the apostles couldn't write. I think maybe Peter was one who either couldn't write or maybe didn't write all of his books, but did dictate some of his books. But the words are his. We have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have Acts, Paul's 13 epistles, letters, 1 Peter, 1 John, and Revelation. The second test, he said, in order to decide what got into the Bible, had to do with orthodoxy. Is it teaching the same message as Jesus? Other than some minor changes in order and some other things, the books of the Bible copy each other in message. So orthodoxy, is it actually what Jesus said? Does it contradict what Jesus said? I think that there was one of the apocryphal books where Thomas maybe struck someone dead because they made fun of his bald head, something like that. But it wasn't very um, apostle-like. So that was not included because it goes directly against what the Bible says. So there was another man named Marcion who was part of the Gnostic piece. And he taught that the God of the Old Testament and New Testament were not compatible with each other. And he only kept the writings of Paul and Luke's gospel. They said that the material world was all evil. So Jesus couldn't have been here in body, even though... Jesus makes it quite clear he is here. And in fact, when he came back, he was here. Thomas was to put his fingers in the nail holes in Jesus' hand, a physical being. So that was part of it. And because of the fact that Jesus was fully here in body, anything that suggested he wasn't was not part of the orthodoxy. And then the third part of it has to do with whether it was used in the church as a whole. You have to think about writing back in those days. Right now, we have printing presses. But at the time, everything was recopied by hand and only copied by people who could write and only read by people who could read. So the circulation took time. And it may be that a church here or there had a letter of Paul. <laughs> Certainly the churches where Paul wrote them letters. It may be that some of them had one gospel or a couple of gospels. And so it became hard to spread things out to the wider church. But which books, which books of the Bible had that universality where many churches used it, included it in its canon, and made it a part of their church? He said something like Philemon was hard. That was a letter to a single person. And John's last two letters were written to two churches. So it may have been very hard to get those books out to many other churches. 
And we don't talk about this now, but when I took a course in college, there were essentially 40 different lines that were different among different versions of the Bible. Or, you know, and most of them were very minor, didn't change the words. So before, if you think about the fact that you had people writing the Bible down and then delivering it to another church, so they had their own copy of it, they were very detailed about it. They knew they were writing the Word of God, and so they were very careful. So when you talk about books that are as big as the New Testament and you have 40 discrepancies, and like I said, the discrepancies are very minor, you can see where it goes. He mentions the Gospel of Thomas is one of those Gnostic texts which was in the library in Egypt. And it wasn't written by Thomas. It came much later. He says that it was written probably around 175 to 180. And I read one article that brought it out later than that. He says that it was possible that it was even written as early as 140, but the idea is Thomas never wrote it. He was not alive during that time. So it fails the test of authorship. It fails the test of orthodoxy because it was Gnostic, and we believe that Jesus was fully human and fully God. So we know it wasn't there, and it didn't have universality because it was only in very limited places that essentially believed in Gnosticism, which was not a viable idea inside the church. And then he says it complicates a little bit, too, because the Bible comes in through translations. People try very hard to write translations, and maybe we'll have another podcast talking about translations. Some of them are word for word. Some of them are meant to more relay the concept in truth, maybe not word for word, but the idea is correct. I took biblical Hebrew back in college just because I was fascinated with ancient languages. And what you don't realize about even the Old Testament is so many places those items are poetry pieces, or some of them are jokes, and you don't get it because it's not in the original language. But when you read it in the original language, suddenly you start seeing the beauty of it all. When you have a translation, because many of us don't read Greek, Aramaic, ancient Hebrew, it's hard to do. So the question is, is that when you have a translation of a certain word, sometimes he says that you get something like Philippians 2.4, which says, not the things of yourselves, each looking out for, but also for the things of others. In Greek, that's what it says. But in English, it says each person should look out for not only his own interest, but also in the interest of others. So even though it's not word for word translation, because we saw the word for word translation was a bit confusing, the concept translation can be important. Eusebius was a patriarch in the Church of Constantinople, and he played a central role inside the Council of Nicaea, and a lot of his writings were important. And he broke the Bible into four groups, undisputed. So there's 27 books in the New Testament. 21 of them are undisputed. That means almost every church, no one's fighting it. We know the authorship of it. No one is going in and saying this book does not belong in the Bible. 21 out of 27 were standard and understood to be part of the Bible. So again, it wasn't the Council of Nicaea. It wasn't the Council of Trent who made these things, 21 books throughout the entire Christian world, and were accepted as books of the Bible. Disputed, that means there's some question there, include James, Jude, Second Peter, Second and Third John, and Hebrews is left out entirely. The third category he had was called spurious, which means that the books were often correct in their theology and maybe even helpful to read, but that doesn't mean that they had the authority of books of the Bible, and Revelation was one of those. For example, Revelation was a lot different than most of the other books in the Bible. Not that it said anything wrong, but just that it had some questions in mind about its authority as being part of the canon. And then the fourth category was heretical, and those were books that failed the tests, should not be included, and that includes the Gospel of Thomas. And so that's why, too, that if we found a new book some big archaeology dig was going around in Israel and dug up a new book and found a whole new book of the Testament, it wouldn't end up getting added into the New Testament because we'd have to prove the authority. Who wrote it? We'd have to prove the orthodoxy. Did it fit in? Those things become hard when we're this many years away from the actions of Jesus. Those people were living right at that time. 
Think about what we know about George Washington or Thomas Jefferson. I mean, they were here 300 years ago, about the same time as Nicene Creed. We know stuff because it was closer to our time, and same thing for them, too. It's going to be harder for us now to possibly ever canonize anything because we couldn't possibly include its authority. So it's not like we're going to come up with a new book, which I always wondered, too. Like, if we came up with a new book, would it get in the Bible? Probably not. So because of all these decisions of which books to keep, and again, it was only six of the books that were sort of decided between that, got codified basically in 367 at the canon with an Easter letter written by Athanasius, who was the first guy to basically give authoritatively that list of 27 books. And he quotes J.I. Packer, the church no more gave us the New Testament canon than Sir Isaac Newton gave us the force of gravity. God gave us gravity. Newton did not create gravity, but recognized it. Same thing with the books of the Bible. In 367, when they made that definitive list, it wasn't that the definitive list was invented at that time. That definitive list had been there since the time of Christ and just got finally put into a list. Some of these epistles that were out there was not canon because they were too recently written. He mentions the Shepherd of Hermas, the Epistles of the Laodosians, their forged documents, the Wisdom of Solomon, the Apocalypse of Peter had concerns. Then there was Origen, who he lived at 254, and he was one of the apostolic fathers who traveled in, the, in that time. And he also came up with the list of the Bible. And he listed 2nd and 3rd John, which other of the early church fathers didn't. They were considered part of the disputed books. Just because they couldn't exactly prove the authority or the authorship of those books. Tertullian in 220 quotes all the canonical books except for Philemon, 2nd Peter, and 3rd John. But he also quoted the Wisdom of Solomon and the Shepherd of Hermas. Irenaeus at 200 AD also witnessed the Bible, and had his own list. But the fact is that 21 of the 27 books were all in there. There was no big conspiracy. And what happened at the very end was this discussion about the six books, including Revelation, and some of the other books that seemed like they could be correct, but there were concerns about them, either because of what they said, concerns about who wrote them, or concerns with their universality. And in the end, he says, the entire books of the Bible are written on the works of the apostles and no more. Nothing comes later and nothing can be forged about it. He brings up Hebrews 1, 1 through 2. In the past, God spoke through ancestors, through the prophets of many times and various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, who he appointed heir of all things and through whom He also made the universe. So they're saying that in the past, in the Old Testament, there were prophets, there were other people who heard the words of God, David, and other people. But in this particular case, now this New Testament came directly from the Son of God. These these books were there from the time when Jesus lived. The apostles wrote them down. They started getting distributed through the church. 21 of them were seen as being part of the church almost instantly recognized right at that time, and the church was very careful to try to decide what should be part of this canon and what shouldn't. They had standards, and it was really over six books that got in and a couple of other books that did not get in and were clearly outside the spectrum of what should become canon. I hope this explains a little bit about how the Bible came to pass. I've heard so many things. You know, being an atheist for 21 years, I had it in my head the entire amount of baloney that went into making the Bible, because I was told that by many different people. But when I read this, I see it was not true. There was no baloney. There was no conspiracy. There was no Constantine and his mother who secretly created a group to decide what was in the Bible. It was a much more natural way, descending right from the time of the apostles. So my challenge to you is to think of a prayer to God about how thankful we are that we do have a canon and that we do know which books of the Bible have the authorship, the theology, the message, and the universality 
so that we can worship God using this amazing book. Everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening. Please remember to tell a friend about this podcast. And if you have anything to say to me, please remember you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'm also on Twitter. My website has all the places that you can contact me, including my email. Please let me know what you think of the podcast, if you have any suggestions for topics, or if you have anything I can pray for you about. I am happy to pray for you, and I will let you know when I've done so. Thanks so much. Have a great week. And remember that we can get the message of God from the Bible by taking small steps. Small steps.